right. Yes, I can. This is the Institute on Ecosystems or Other Pet Seminar Series. I'm Bruce Maxwell, I'm right on the leadership side of the Institute on Ecosystems. Uh, these presentations are online as well. So um, if you do ask questions, if you remember, you push the button here. Fully sales will help you with it. And the little green light will come on and you can ask the question. And people outside can hear, hear the question. Otherwise, you can. Okay. <laughs> so we have Christine Verhill with us. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology. And uh, welcome to MSU. I, I, I thought you'd been here probably longer, but anyway, good to, <laughs> good to have you here. She has a Master of Science degree in Biology from the University of New Brunswick, and then a PhD from uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. She is interested in physiological mechanisms, limiting performance and resilience of fish populations in nature, and applying this mechanistic knowledge to assess environmental uh, tolerance limits. So very applicable, I think, to, to many of the issues that we're dealing with in environmental <laughs> science these days. She has studied the ecological physiology of diverse fish taxa in relation to a wide range of management applications, ranging from the guidance of rainbow trout stocking for sport fishing to operations of agricultural diversion structures um, and, and higher hydropower dams. So whatever blocks those fish, you can help figure out how to get them around. I guess. <laughs> or at uh, least how it affects them. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Good. Well, so thank you for, uh, for coming. Oh, she, oh, she also said that, that uh, she previously had done a postdoc at UC Davis and, um, and, and just before coming to Montana was at Mount Alice. Or Allison. Allison. Not Allison. Not Allison. Thank, you. thank you for, for coming and we're looking forward to your Okay. Talk. Thank you. Thanks for the great introduction and thanks for the invitation to come and thank you guys for, for coming here to let me talk on about what I love to do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as you said, I'm I'm relatively new here, so a lot I'm gonna talk a little bit about work that I've done during postdoc, but a lot of the stuff I'm doing here in Montana, I don't have a lot of data yet, so I'm gonna tell you more about my plans and aspirations here in Montana and some projects that are funded at the moment. And really what I do is I use physiological measurements to try to inform management of declining fish populations. Uh, this is the Verhill Lab that, um, uh, and I kind of have to say that any data that I'm going to present to you and plans I'm going to tell you about that I'm going to carry out here in Montana, these are the people who are doing the work, not really, really so much me. So I really kind of want to shout out to the students, the graduate students and the undergraduate students and technicians in my lab. I feel very privileged to have such an amazing group of people to work with. So I'm really going to talk a lot today about using physiological measurements to inform us about declining fish populations. Uh, it's a little bit different of a focus than we tend to talk about in ecology, ecology and environmental departments. So just to make sure we're all on the page, we like to define what is physiology. Yeah. So you think of any organism, whether it's a fish or any other organism, they have all these molecules in their bodies that interact together. And so you have these biochemical interactions and pathways that run the processes in the body and also form the anatomy that, that serves as structures for those biochemical processes to work around. And all of these work together as physiological systems to just help maintain that living organism. When we talk about um, as ecologists, we're often looking at relationships between the environment and performance of, of organisms. But really, there's this interaction in between all these physiological systems at the individual fish level that are driving those relationships. And I'm really interested in looking at those physiological processes to really understand what are the mechanisms that link environment and performance of fish populations. So in my lab, we try to really bridge the gaps between physiological research and large scale ecological questions by relating these physiological measurements to important functions that fish have to perform to thrive in nature. 
So things like eating, swimming, predator avoidance, and reproduction, all of these are very metabolically demanding and challenging for fish. And so understanding how the physiology relates to those is very informative. I do this by relating across all scales of biological organization. I do um, from that the molecular level, looking at gene expression and, and changes of creating proteins in the body to drive these processes. Um, other molecules like looking at hemoglobin or reactive oxygen species in the body. I'm trained as a cardiorespiratory physiologist. So I'm very much like to look at how the heart anatomy and functioning uh, drive animal performances. <laughs> And so then I um, also do research looking at the individual organism level. This is a swim tunnel respirometer with a rainbow trout in it. And in these respirometers, we can, it's kind of like a treadmill. And we can control the water velocity and we can seal it off and track the metabolic removal of oxygen by the fish so we can quantify metabolic rate. I've also taken, during my PhD research, I developed this giant swim changer, chamber where I could swim 500 fish all at the same time. And so then assess across the whole population distribution and variation in swimming endurance. Um, and then I try to kind of take these measurements and relate them to the wild. This is a, a video of steelhead trout in the Tuolumne River in California. Um, so, as you can see, I go across all levels of, uh, or most levels of biological organization. So really I'm gonna talk about today is what I'm focusing and my students are focusing on in my lab, which are two main areas. One of them is sublethal effects of temperature on fish. And I'm really gonna focus on looking at both metabolic capacity responses to temperature in fish and the immune status of fish. I'm also going to talk a little bit about a, a project where we're using uh, measurements of phenotypic traits to try to predict uh, eco ecosystem performance of fish. So I'm going to start off talking about some projects looking at sublethal effects of temperature. Pretty remarkable, the temperature ranges that fish live in across the world. This is a notophenoid fish that lives on, on at the, the bottom of the ocean around Antarctica. These fish live at temperatures around three to four degrees Celsius, so very close to freezing. And this temperatures through their entire lifespan, the temperature might change by one degree Celsius. And no matter how slowly you do it, you take one of these fish up to like six degrees Celsius, they die. They're just, they're, they're, they've got this small little thermal niche and you really can't take an individual outside of that niche. If we go to the other extreme, uh, a few years ago, I was lucky enough to travel in Death Valley during the spring at, where we have the desert pupfish. And this little, called Salt Creek, which is a super salty, hardly even looks like a creek, it looks more like a puddle. These guys flourish in there in Death Valley. This is where the highest temperatures on earth are recorded. And so they endure extremely hot temperatures, but it also can get very cool in Death Valley. And so they have this broad range of temperatures that they experience. And this is just a, a picture of doing fish physiology in Canada in the winter out, outside in the hatcheries. So really what, but for these extremes, from the low temperature to the high temperature extremes, what we really think is limiting performance of fish is their ability to get oxygen from the environment into the body to the mitochondria in their cells to produce ATP, which is really the currency to do any work in, uh, in the body. <laughs> and so we call this, this theory of, of limitations and getting oxygen to the body, the oxygen and capacity um, limited thermal tolerance hypothesis. And to test this, uh, the, the measurements that I tend to perform um, are things like resting metabolic rate. So if you, if you look at here, this, um, this y-axis would be your metabolic rate, the rate that a, 
a fish removes oxygen from its environment, while the x-axis is temperature. And what we see is the resting metabolic rate, which really defines the basic needs, the basic metabolic demands in a fish just to keep its body functioning. So this is like a quiescent fish, hasn't eaten recently, so it's not investing energy into digesting a meal, it's just surviving. And this resting metabolic rate increases exponentially as temperature increases. And this is nothing to do with regulation, this is just thermo, simple thermodynamics. They have no control or very little control over this. So resting metabolic rate increases exponentially. So you can already see that as temperatures get warm, the fish have a challenge to get oxygen from the environment to meet these demands. But then another important measurement that I perform is maximum metabolic rate. So that's the fastest rate the fish can get oxygen out of the environment into its cells. And that, that's limited by biochemistry and anatomy and functioning of the heart. And the response of maximum metabolic rate is a bit more complicated tends to start pretty low at cool temperatures and increases until it hits a peak and then it starts dropping again. Um, so you can imagine that this resting metabolic rate is kind of the floor of their metabolic demand and this defines the ceiling, the maximum as they, they can go. And so what gets really interesting to me is actually the difference between resting and maximum metabolic rate, because this defines this aerobic capacity that the fish have available to them to do all the things they have to do, like that swimming, catching a meal, digesting a meal, or reproduction. And we call this difference the aerobic scope. So aerobic scope is the difference between maximum and resting metabolic rate. And this defines their capacity to perform work above and beyond basic needs. We can define this point where the aerobic scope is maximal as the optimal temperature for fish. And you can imagine right around here and here where aerobic scope gets zero, fish are in trouble, in big trouble. But there's also this kind of gray zone here that between the optimal range and the, that aerobic scope of zero, that we can have sublethal effects in the fish, and those aren't quite so easy to define. So I applied this approach to some of the research I did during my postdoc at UC Davis in California. And, when, and here, this was research that we did in collaboration with an irrigation district, a hydropower company. And they were going through FERC relicensing of a dam that had uh, Endangered Species Act, Act threatened uh, Central Valley steelhead trout downstream of the dam. Um, so these, these fish, uh, the, this, the, the dam is upstream of this. This is the Tuolumne River. Um, the, the consensus is that their threatened status is really related to high temperatures. And because of this, the EPA dictates an 18 degrees Celsius seven day average daily maximum um, criteria on all, all the waters that along the entire west coast of the United States that these coastal or that steelhead are in. So this means that if you look at the maximum temperature every day for seven days and you average that, it cannot, that average cannot exceed 18 degrees Celsius. So we performed a swim tunnel respirometry study. So remember I showed you the trout swimming in the swim tunnel before. We set up right here. So this is, this is a dam that's downstream of the dam was being relicensed and we were able to set up right there. We could pull water right from our pin stocks and use power in a pretty, a relatively remote site, but we had lots of power because we're right at high power dam. And we captured all the fish we tested within this little stretch of the Tuolumne River. <laughs> So we performed stream side swim tunnel respirometry to assess the thermal response of aerobic scope. So just to remind you that you have your metabolic rate, temperature, resting metabolic rate, we expect to exponentially increase with temperature, and the maximum metabolic rate we expect to be sort of this hump shape, and you got aerobic scope as the difference, and the optimal temperature where aerobic scope is maximum. So we saw what, um, just what we expected to see, this exponential increase in resting metabolic rate, and it was pretty tight. It might be hard for you to see, but I actually do have confidence intervals on this plot. They're pretty tight. Um, 
maximum metabolic rate was a little bit different than we expected. It was pretty flat and linear, and it kind of reflected pretty well that resting metabolic rate. So when we calculated aerobic scope, it was pretty flat, which was kind of surprising for these fish. We were able to statistically identify an optimal range where, where aerobic scope was um, maximal. And that was a pretty broad range from about 17 degrees Celsius to 24.5 degrees Celsius. Um, we were pretty shocked to see how high this went. We expected it to be higher than 18 degrees Celsius, but almost 25 degrees Celsius was way harder than we thought steelhead trout would be happy in. So, and then what we did is we just kind of went into the literature and we found other Pacific salmon species that this response had been defined for. So all of these lines are things like sockeye salmon, coho salmon, some rainbow trout population from uh, Australia and another one from Canada. And this is the Central Valley steelhead. So you see that they're pretty, they're pushed over to, to high temperatures. Um, so we concluded that they're pretty highly thermally adjusted to, to the system. <laughs> We didn't conclude about adaptation because we, we have no evidence of genetic linking to, to this measurement for these guys. So that was pretty interesting to see how adjusted they are. And we also definitely showed that that EPA criteria of 18 degrees Celsius is definitely underestimated for these, these fish. So we questioned the broad application of these EPA thermal limits throughout the entire latitudinal range. I think I forgot to mention that we're at pretty well the southern edge of the distribution of these fish as well here in California. So it's kind of an interesting population to study. So as I told you, I'm really interested in trying to relate that, that sort of sublethal zone and relating that to those fish surviving in the ecosystem. So we followed up this study with putting some cameras, some GoPro cameras in the river to try to look at these fish. And this is sort of, if you watch this fish, you can see, if you see that pop up, that's feeding. It's grabbing a food particle as it's coming by. And you can also see that it's wagging its tail or it's, it's beating its fin. So there's two measurements that we can make here. Is one the feeding rate, but also the tail beat frequency rate from these measurements. And by matching these to the temperature in the, in the um, river and swim tunnel respirometry experiments in the lab, uh, we can kind of make some meaningful interpretations. So again, this is that swim tunnel respirometer. And by doing measurements of metabolic rate at, and tailbeat frequencies at different temperatures in the lab, we were able to derive the relationship between metabolic rate and tailbeat frequency that was um, also mediated by temperature. We took that relationship and then we did measurements of tailbeat frequencies on those videos of the fish in the wild. And we plugged those into this relationship to try to predict what is the metabolic rate or metabolic demands of just holding station in that river for these fish. And this is what we saw. So we, we did these, these video um, measurement of 14 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius. There's a little bit in here. So this is the metabolic rate here on the y-axis. So that's what we measured in the lab in the swim tunnel respirometer. And these are the tail beat frequencies on the x-axis that we measured in the lab. And this is the, these are all the individual fish we measured in the lab at 14 degrees Celsius. And that's that relationship, this relationship right here that we derived in the lab. When we went to the videos in the field, on average, we counted just under three hertz as a tailbeat frequency. So then we plugged that number into this relationship and we found that this is about where the metabolic rate of fish holding station in the river is. This box, that's the aerobic scope of that fish at that temperature. So, so that's the resting metabolic rate and the maximum metabolic rate. So we can say at 14 degrees Celsius, that's where the fish is met metabolically. It's got, it's still got a lot of scope left to do all of those things it has to do in the wild. And even at 20 degrees Celsius, 
this is where the fish is. So that fish, it's not even 50% of its total aerobic scope that it's lost. So at 20 degrees Celsius, two degrees Celsius above that temperature that the EPA guidelines were, these fish seem to still have plenty of aerobic scope to hold station in flows and do other, um, carry out other tasks. So they're quite happy at 18, but they're doing fine at 20. Uh, so my aerobic scope measurements suggest they're doing fine at 24.5 degrees Celsius. Exactly. And this looking at they're um, adding in that metabolic demand of swimming in the river. Yeah, um, definitely 20 degrees Celsius, yeah. If you went to the northern range of these fish and tested them, they'd be less happy at 24. We would predict that the fish in the more northern range where, where it's rivers are cooler um, would have poorer performance at 24 degrees Celsius. One thing that we cannot say here is that we didn't do any genetics on these fish. So it could just be that these fish through their lives were gradually exposed to these warmer temperatures within a lifespan. And so it's more of a plastic response as opposed to, so we can't say definitively whether there's a genetic difference between those different fish. Maybe those fish from the cooler rivers, if you from day one of their life were exposed to these warmer temperatures would be able to do this as well. Not sure yet. More research required on that one. So that was, that was California. Now moving to Montana, had a little bit of a diversion to Canada in between there, but don't have time to fit that research in here. Um, and so I, I wanted to carry, when, when I got my job here at Montana State University, I really wanted to be able to follow through with this type of research of doing physiology right at the river. So one of the first things I did when I got here is I built this mobile lab so that I can take it right stream side, I can fill that lab with water from the river, I can take fish from the river within minutes, they're in the lab doing measurements, and within 24 hours, they're back into their ecosystem. So I have two, in this mobile lab, I have two recirculating systems that I can control temperature and all kinds of conditions. I have these six respirometer chambers where I can do metabolic rate measurements, and I have sort of some extra space for more equipment coming in, hopefully in the near future when these some tunnel respirometers. So it's the first thing I did, but then I needed a project. What was I gonna do with my mobile lab? And right around, I came here in 2017, the summer of 2017, and the year before, in 2016, we had that crazy die off of mountain whitefish on the Madison River. And you know that, that was, um, estimated to cost Montana economy millions of dollars. And it happened again my first summer here in 2017, but to a smaller extent. <laughs> and this, uh, this die-off was attributed to a disease, proliferative kidney disease, which is considered to be very warm temperature related to disease. So talking to the region three um, Montana fish, wildlife, and parts biologist, we were really surprised that this happened in the Yellowstone River. Like that's a pretty healthy river where, where the, the, um, the trout are at least. And we've got some rivers in, in the state that kind of begs to question, are they kind of a ticking time bomb? So, um, so it kind of really gives me this question about immune status of fish in Montana with warming temperatures of rivers. So we decided to send the mobile lab for my first project with it to the Madison River. We're particularly concerned about the lower Madison River because that's, you've got Ennis Lake where, that, where the water gains a lot of heat from the sun and then downstream there's a lot of fishing effort uh, on those fish and really warm temperatures. Um, so my student, uh, Megan, uh, Hyman right here is going to do uh, mountain, uh, has this plan to do mountain whitefish temperature physiology on the Madison River, both measuring tracking metabolic capacity and immune status on the Madison. Although our interest is the lower Madison, um, we know where the white, we thought we knew at least, a little hint of something to come, 
But the mount, the juvenile mountain whitefish, really, these are catch per unit effort, and the red is a high catch per unit effort, and the yellow is low. This is uh, Jan Boyer's work from um, my department here. We thought we had this like great spot to catch mountain whitefish, and we and just we wanted to kind of set ourselves up for a success at the beginning. So we said, let's just start at the upper Madison River, where we know we can do this. And so this was, became our study site on the Madison River. So same sort of idea as what, what I did, described I did in California. Um, problem is, after about June 4th, we couldn't find any mountain whitefish. So Jan finished her work in late May. So there seems to be some redistribution of mountain whitefish after late May or um, if you remember last summer, we had huge flows going through. We had that, uh, and Hebkin Dam was just rushing through, so maybe those flows had something to do with it. But turned out, I think we caught about 10 mountain whitefish all summer. And every day, about eight hours of electrofishing through, through this area. So we found lots of rainbow trout, so we said, well, let's do this on rainbow trout instead, just to get some data. So I apologize as I switch from my Mac to PC the uh, it seems to randomly eliminate my quote my uh, uh, error bars but this this was a, re a relatively large error bar here so this is a the resting or the routine metabolic rate what we expect to see the exponential increase uh, max metabolic rate was more similar to what we expect to see uh -huh, look those error bars the confidence intervals are pretty wide there we need to get more data to fill up these. This is preliminary data for now. Aerobic scope had this very nice, perfect curve, but and again, my confidence intervals are disappearing here, but you can imagine there's a pretty big confidence intervals there. So we definitely do have to um, get some more data, but it was a significant relationship. We had p-values of 0.02. <laughs> and I was able to derive a rough, optimal range from 17 to 23 degrees Celsius. So that's the kind of temperature range that we think on the upper Madison River, the rainbow trout are, are doing the best metabolically at least. Right around 25 degrees Celsius, which is the highest we went, we got two data points here and you can see that they're pretty low in aerobic scope. We also have two other fish that died. So we're pretty sure 25 is too high for rainbow trout in the Madison River. So think about the California, we were at 25, no, not much of a problem in California. Um, the other interesting measurement is factorial aerobic scope. So I told you uh, uh, aerobic scope is the difference between resting and maximum metabolic rate. Factorial aerobic scope is actually you just divide maximum metabolic rate by resting metabolic rate. So how many fold can we increase that? And that's very interesting because there's been a few studies looking at the energetic demands of digesting a meal, which are actually pretty high for a fish on fish like salmonid fish. And we think that a salmonid fish needs to be able to double their metabolic rate to digest a meal. So they need a factorial aerobic scope of about two. So they say if any fish that's down here probably is not able to digest food and incorporate that food into the body. That's it's a bad thing for fish in wild. And I took, you can't see my confidence intervals here, but I took a, a con conservative estimate of where the confidence intervals interact with that. And that looks to be about 23.5 degrees Celsius. So again, I caution you, this is preliminary data. We need to fill in some more data points, but we have this rough idea. Um, we, so now we want to relate those, what, it, what temperatures do these fish experience? So we actually had an array of uh, thermographs throughout the two, these are the two channels of the Madison River that where we collected these fish. And I've, we're still processing that data from them, but I just kind of pulled one quickly. So this is temperature. Um, this is from this thermograph right here. So this is probably our best case scenario, the more um, upstream. Um, point and I um, and these are plots from July 1st to September 7th is about here um, We had a point where we think it it got dry 
that the water level went down so far that it got exposed to air. So I just deleted that data. It was at 40 degrees Celsius, which I'm pretty sure water wasn't. We bought new thermographs this year that will detect when they become dry. But you can see this is that optimal range that I define, and this is where they're unable to digest a meal. So the good, thing, the good news here is that every day they spend most of their time within this optimal range. But they do a lot of the days through, um, from July through September, they're popping up into this, this range, which could be potentially stre pretty stressful for the fish. My guess is here, if this is where the, the loggers were exposed to air, this it was probably warmest in this stretch though too. So it, we're missing some information. <laughs> So just to follow up our, our, our follow-up plans here is at the end of the summer, our collaborators with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks actually found some mountain whitefish. So we have some better ideas of where to look for them next summer. So we're gonna fill in, we're gonna continue to, to fill in the rainbow trout values. Um, we're gonna try to get mountain whitefish onto that curve. And also so we can just compare all of the salmonids that are abundant in that area. Also look at brown trout. And see what the differences are there. Not gonna, that's the end of our funding next year, so we're not gonna make it down to the lower Madison River, unfortunately, as our original plans were. But if you remember, the whole thing that kind of got me thinking about this was the immune status of the fish and the warm temperatures. Um, and we, even though we're not gonna make it to the lower Madison, we do have these points where the fish are at stressfully temp stressful temperatures even in the upper Madison. So I think we have some potentially interesting data coming through the lab to look at that. <laughs> so the immune system, I'm not an immunologist, so I'm not gonna go too much into detail and put you through too much about the immune system, but just really generally, there's really kind of two processes um, or two types of immune responses. There's the innate immune response. And so this is, these components are there in your body at all times and they respond to any pathogen or a body that's identified as foreign identically. There's no specificity. And they're, because they're in your body all the time, they're very fast responsive. So this is hours, zero to 12 hours is, is the response time. Um, the adaptive immune responses, those are much slower. Those take days to weeks to, to come together, but they're also specific to the pathogens. So they have a much more specific and effective response usually. And then there's these sort of mediators. So if with your innate immune system, you might have what's called a, a phagocyte. And if it comes in contact with a foreign body, it engulfs it and produces all these enzymes and just tries to destroy it. Um, then you have these what's called lymphocytes that kind of bridge the two immune systems. And if they attach to one of these foreign bodies, they bring together that foreign body to that phagocyte. And when it's attached to that lymphocyte, the phagocyte can actually produce antibodies. And antibodies are part of that adaptive immune response. So really, basically, we've got this fast-acting, non-specific innate immune response, slow-acting but specific um, adaptive immune, immune response. Um, the problem with looking at immune responses in fish is that it's very difficult um, to very directly assess. You can't sterilize fish. Fish die pretty quickly if we try to put them through processes to sterilize them. But the problem is when you put fish in warm waters, microbes love warm water. So they multiply very quickly. So we get this as temperatures increase, we get increased presence of microbes. So we can never really distinguish immune response to those microbes versus immune responses to the temperature. Uh, the other big problem with uh, looking at immune responses to temperature is that when fish get to high temperatures, those invoke a stress response in the fish and they produce cortisol, which are sort of stereotypical stress response. Cortisol influences lots of things in the body. One of the things it influences is it impairs these processes, the biochemical pathways 
that contribute to the pro these processes, cortisol inhibits them. So cortisol also inhibits stress response. So we have this sort of challenge, and I'm learning that this is why not many <laughs> people really try to look at immune response, but it also makes it interesting because we don't know a lot about it. As aquatic ecosystems warm, we know we get immunocompromisation from the stress in the fish. Not really sure about what temperature, because it's always confounded with these other variables, but maybe. And we also know that we get an increase in presence of microbes. So I'm sort of starting this kind of pilot research, just exploring to see what type of relationships we can see about the immune system of fish and different temperatures in their ecosystem. So these are two diseases we're very interested in, Montana whirling disease and proliferative kidney disease. This is what happened on Yellowstone in 2016. <clears throat> so we're working with very small juvenile fish right now. So there's not, we're, in, we're kind of limited on what we can sample. So I am collaborating with Jennifer Lackowick from Plant Sciences and Pathology Department to do gene expression and, and looking at different genes related to immune. So we've got, um, don't worry about what these names mean. I'm just trying to, these are places we've got a gene that's related to the innate immune response, another gene related to the adaptive immune response. Because when these fish, we're catching these fish from the river, uh, we don't know where they've been the last day, so we don't really know what temperature they've been at. So we're trying to put a lot of effort to kind of characterize what level of temperature stress these fish are. These are all just a bunch of genes that other papers have repeatedly shown to respond to temperature stress in salmonid fish. So we've got a suite of these that we've already been able to identify uh, promoters for. We're also looking at oxidative stress. <clears throat> if you remember our aerobic scope response to temperature, when you start getting to these really low um, aerobic scope levels, those fish are probably experiencing periods where they, they're not getting enough oxygen from the environment. And so they start developing reactive oxygen species in their body, which causes oxidative damage. And so that's what the oxidative stress um, genes are looking for is some indicator of that occurring in these fish. And so we're still, we're actually just at the point that we've been able to truth and, and um, test these promoters on rainbow trout and mountain whitefish and soon we'll be moving on to, to look at quantifying their responses in the fish we collected next year. That's where we are with that. So I'm gonna move from there onto the, the second area of research that we're doing in, in my lab, predicting ecosystem performance using phenotypic traits. And we've got two, I'm really gonna talk about my West Slope cutthroat trout work today, but I have also have some projects using, looking at endangered pallid sturgeon that I'm doing similar approaches to. So these are my pallid sturgeons, my graduate student, Matea Jokic, that's working with them. I'm going to talk about Taylor Pearl's um, West Slope cutthroat trout more today. <clears throat> so we're working with uh, Sokokini Springs Hatchery. They're a conservation fish hatchery that they capture wild uh, West Slope cutthroat trout from streams and they bring them into the hatchery, rear them as broodstock, and those offspring from those fish get stocked into alpine lakes for restoration purposes. The problem is that during this rearing um, period for the broodstock, we get some fish that just, we bring them into the hatchery and they just never really seem to thrive. And they either die or they never reproduce. So the concern about this is twofold. One is if there's specific phenotypes or worse genotypes that don't do well in the hatchery, we end up getting artificial selection. So those genes don't, that are important for survival in the wild, don't get stocked into those re um, restoration stocking. The other thing is that when we have mortalities and, and fish that fail to reproduce, they have to bring more of those wild captured brood stock into the hatchery. And so they're removing and they're damaging those um, existing populations more. <clears throat> 
to do the cuts. So they want to they want to limit the number of wild fish they bring into the hatchery, and limit that selection, that artificial selection. So Taylor's project really revolves around identifying fish that are in danger of not doing well in the hatchery using phenotypic traits to predict in hatchery performance. And how she's going to do this is we've got this suite of, of measurements that she's going to make through these fish at, at key time periods of their, their um, time in the hatchery. Um, she's going to look at bold versus shy syndromes. I'll talk a bit more about that and stress response in a second. And, and these are kind of new novel techniques that, aren't, that are just starting to get attention in, in the ecophysiology world. And then she's also going to look at morphology, which means taking all these points and looking at distances between these points in the fish, which is a more established approach to look at different ecotypes within populations. Um, <clears throat> so bold versus shy personalities. Seems a bit weird for a physiologist or even a scientist to call a fish bold or shy. Um, but there's actually a lot of research that's starting to grow that really is starting to establish both personality or behavioral differences within the population and that these are genetically linked or heritable. So there's a guy named Pottinger that in like about the 1990s to the early 2000s did a lot of work that he started seeing that he actually called um, them reactive versus proactive. So a bold fish or a proactive fish tends to be less risk adverse and it tends to be more socially dominant compared to a shy or reactive fish. So these are the fish, these, these bold or proactive fish, they're the ones that are in the middle of the lake where like, there's great food supplies, but they're at risk of being eaten by a predator. While those reactive fish are hanging out in the reeds where it's safe, so there's maybe not as much food, but they're not gonna get eaten by a predator. Um, and so Pottinger did selection experiments and he was actually able to create lines of fish that were more bold or more shy. And as he created those lines, he started to look at what's the mechanism, what's really driving this. And he was able to show that shy fish have a much stronger stress response under conditions than those bold fish. So they produce cortisol a lot. Remember I told you about cortisol and immune response? and the other effects. So then he kind of reversed these around and he started to identify fish that had, were very reactive in terms of their stress response and fish that weren't. And he started selecting those and he showed those also, showed those behavior differences. So coming from two different. There've been other people in the years have followed through with similar studies and, and we're starting to, to build, at least in some populations and species of fish that this is potentially a real thing, likely a real thing. Um, what did I want to say? And recently there's some um, research that's been looked at conservation hatchery fish that have been stocked in the wild and comparing those to wild fish, showing conservation hatchery like origin fish are more bold behavior than, the, than wild fish, and more risk, less risk adverse than wild fish. So cortisol is coming back up here. <clears throat> Remember I told you cortisol impairs the immune status. Um, so that's through biochemical pathways. There's these biochemical pathways that sort of that really set up the immune responses in the fish. Same thing, biochemical pathways that drive growth in fish as well as reproduction. And cortisol impairs all three of these. So so cortisol, a fish that has this high stress response and reactivity could potentially, um, if it's experiencing a lot of stress, could be in big trouble. When you think about the hatchery environment, number one, there's no predators. So those risk adverse fish, there's no real disadvantage to being risk adverse. And there's all these stressors that these fish experience in a hatchery. So potentially they're just constantly being bombarded by stressors. So we're really interested in looking at this shy versus bold personality type as well as stress response in fish in the hatchery 
to see uh, if those can predict performance in the hatchery. So we've got these three types of variables we're measuring, bold versus shy, stress response, as well as the morphology. And what we're hoping is that we can take all these variables that we're measuring and we can actually time fish that the, where these variables co-vary together, we can define different phenotypic profiles. Um, so just, I've, I've just given you three, we might have four, we might only have two, but even if we identify these different phenotypic profiles based on these inter-individual variation in these variables, then we're hoping we can relate those different profiles to their productivity in the hatchery. So if you think of this as just the population distribution in production of eyed eggs, these the eyed eggs. Um, our hypothesis is that you might get one phenotypic profile that's the poor the, um, over here that's not producing um, very much, and then you have another profile that's over here that's producing a lot. I just realized I have this backwards. Should be pointing here, here, or here. <laughs> so that's really. Um, uh, the, um, yeah, and so then we can very early on during the hatchery process, we can identify fish that are unlikely to reproduce, and that can allow the hatchery managers to start integrating um, responses to that and try to um, change conditions for those small number of fish that aren't going to do well. So that's, um, that really kind of sums up what, uh, what's going, the main things that are going in my lab. I have a whole group of, a huge group of people that have been extremely helpful and supportive in developing research, and a big group of funding group um, bodies that have helped out my research. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. <laughs> yes? I got a question. So how does your work relate to the hoot owl our hours that they establish. Mm, yes. What are your temperatures look like compared to theirs? Oh, geez, I haven't compared that. I would have to look. Yeah, because because part of the idea was because um um th those those hoot owl closure temperatures were based on a study that took uh, rainbow trout, brown trout, and white fish, and they kind of they exposed them, I believe, to a simulated catch and release and then they put them into trap boxes and left them in the river and and that's kind of where those were um stemmed from and so i kind of question how how well mountain whitefish are going to do when you put them in this little trap net so that's one of the um drivers of this research to just bring them in the mobile lab and do the measurements but i that's a good question. I don't know offhand what those temperatures are. Do you know who did the study with the simulated catch and release? That was Boyd was the last name, and that was out of that was out of our department too, I believe. That's I'll have to look that up. That. Yeah, it's a good question. That's that's uh, yeah. In your, <clears throat> go ahead. Go ahead, Ted. In your acknowledgments, you've left off all the last names. How did you happen to do that? <laughs> space. <laughs> I was trying to find enough space. Oh, actually, I'm glad you said that because actually I was trying to find enough space because my technician, Josh Heisman, like I identified the, um, the graduate students in these projects, but Josh works in every one of those projects and is this like amazing resource in my lab. And, that's actually why the, I lost the names because I was trying to make a pitch room for a specific picture for Josh. <laughs> so that's why that came about, Tad. Do you have some expectations for the morphology component of those three responses that you are measuring? So if shy fish have a higher stress response, are they also smaller? I, I mean, it's, it's a hard one to hypothesize because I've never found any studies that have actually linked them. Like, so the, there's lots of studies, especially with the lake trout in the, in the Great Lakes that have looked at this morphology to identify different ecotypes. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen anyone try to link that with the behavior. 
Um, so we do, there are studies that show the morphology to be related to what, like a, a nutritional niche. So, you know, maybe if a bold fish is eating different things than a shy fish, um, that, you know, that, that might be part of the mechanism of relationships there. Uh, we're not really going into that with the bold, shy, and stress with any expectations or, or hypotheses of where the morphology will fit in. We're just, that's, that's another thing that's been used to kind of classify into these different kind of ecotypes is why we brought it in, but I'll let you know in a, <laughs> in a year. Um, yeah. um, so is a is thought that within, within natural populations, some of those bold fish will be you know, leveled out because of osprey will eat them if they're hanging out with some other species. But within the hatchery, they're all bold because there's no check on that. And so then you stock a whole bunch of bold fish and they all get eaten by osprey. Is that? So the, the hypothesis that we're going is more that we bring these fish into the hatchery and some of them are bold and some are shy. And so one thing I didn't tell you is there's quite a few studies that have shown when you take a population of fish and you assess all of them for bold versus shy, and then you change conditions, their level of boldness and shyness might change, but their rank stays pretty similar. So what I'm hypothesizing is that with that shy personality becomes that hyper stress response. And in the hatchery, they're, they're constantly being stressed. So, they're, so they have chronically high cortisol levels. Cortisol impairs reproduction, growth, and immune status. So they're just, they're just never able to thrive in the hatchery. So they don't produce eggs. So they never actually contribute. Only the bold fish contribute to the offspring. That make, does that make sense? Yeah, they get stocked. And then that, that's what gets stocked. That's the hypothesis that we're working on there. So the physiology portion, you didn't ever talk about, or maybe maybe I missed it, um, about the size of the fish. And, the, and does that affect their physiology? Yeah, and so all those metabol metabolic rate measurements that, that we perform are always, um, they're actually always uh, adjusted for size. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so and if you use my units, they're actually towards... Um, we use allometric coefficients to because um, per body mass, large fish tend to have a lower metabolic rate than small fish. Um, there are some, um, I mean, the the, the um, Madison River stuff. They were all pretty similar size range. We we're getting the yearlings, so um, they were pretty size range. But there there is some evidence that temperature affects larger organisms more, like apiculothermic organisms more than small, and we're, we're seeing size distributions change as temperatures are warming in, um, in the ecosystem. So definitely size is, is a thing there. I just, not something I've been looking into a lot. It seems like oxygen plays into this as well, but it does temperature itself limit the oxygen available to the fish? Or is it stream flow, or how do those things so, interact? It so seems this like is a, yeah. confounding, potential yeah. confounding. Right? So in fact, temperature alone, and, and this is often a misconception by ecologists, temperature alone does not um, limit the amount of oxygen available to fish. Hmm. So the, the solubility of oxygen in the water decreases uh, okay. as temperature increases, but the partial pressure, the gas tension of what does not change. And that's what's important. Like fish have that counter current exchange across the gills, which is really efficient. And they have hemoglobin, which right. between those. And so there's actually studies that have, have implanted <coughs> probes to monitor the amount of oxygen in the arterial blood of fish. And as they increase temperature, you don't really see a drop in the oxygen content for the fish. And that's just because it's really that pressure gradient from the water into the blood that's going through the gills that is what drives the fish picking up the oxygen, how quickly they can pick up the oxygen. We have so efficient with count 
that's so efficient with counter current exchange of positive yields. Now, often something that comes together with high temperatures is eutrophication. So if the biological oxygen demand of that system increases, that could decrease that, that pressure and tension, and that could impact the fish. But the oxygen capacity limited thermal tolerance, that's just talking, it's just a matter that the fish needs to bring the oxygen into its body faster because that exponential increase in resting metabolic rate. All right, so in nature, you would never have a fish density that would pull down the oxygen level enough to have an effect on, in other words, to be Definitely not gonna say density. never. <laughs> no, I mean, it would be I'm not gonna agree to that. Right. It's, un, you know, it's unlikely, like rivers, and creeks, you know, they're, they're constantly being stirred up and, 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 exp and um, lakes, I mean, lakes get more complicated because you have turnover of the lakes and, and some stagnant zones and that, but yeah, it's, and it, it's that, so what I'm going to say is by first physical principles, it's not content of oxygen that limits. If there's other variables that are coming into play there, for example, eutrophication or increased biological oxygen demand in the system, that could bring the content down and that could influence them. But yeah, that's, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine as a physiologist. <laughs> Great, okay, well we should come. Oh. You, well, you, sort of em right? you emphasized that it was costly to digest your food for fish, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, on a relative basis, uh, among organisms, do fish pay more to digest their food, or? Uh, uh, I would say not. Really. It depends on the fish too. Yeah. You know, you have herbivorous fish mm -hmm. that are just constantly grazing, so it's just like a low grade, constant metabolic demand. Mm -hmm. Depending on something like a flounder, mm -hmm. that might just and wait and just um, come out, grab something and then go and, and digest for a while. So then those would be very high metabolic demands. I, I, I'm not sure about, I mean, it, it's metabolically demanding for us. Have you guys ever sat down and had a meal and then start sweating as you're eating? <laughs> like that's, that's your metabolism. And so um, it's metabolically demanding for everything. To digest a meal, but I, I'm not going to comment on that. Demanding process. relative to what other activities? <clears throat> um, so I'll give you an example. Salmonid fish, I told you that that factorial aerobic scope, um, we think that they need to minimally be able to double their, their resting meta metabolic rate mm -hmm. in order to or have the room to double it uh -huh. in order to digest a meal. The highest factorial aerobic scope that's been measured in a salmonid fish, remember we're talking about like sockeye salmon that migrate up these um, mountain passes, um, uh, is 10. So, so if we're going double, so it's, it's significant. You talk, so snakes are the, the model organism of choice to study this. You know, think about a python when they, and, and you, you see that those giant blobs mm -hmm. and a python um, sort of consumes a meal and it's that's all it can do for the next however many days is digest it's got its entire um, scope is is dedicated to to feeding I I look at and you know being a, a fish person there, there could be other strategies but I think of there's kind of two strategies. One strategy, like a salmonic fish, is they're designed that their highest metabolic demands is for swimming. I mean, look at a salmonic fish. It's just it's built for swimming. It's got it's all muscle for those those tail muscles. And so so diet is relatively low for um, diet. Uh, we see specific dynamic action. So just swimming is relatively low for them. But, um, but then you get some organisms that they're actually designed that the most metabolically demanding activity is digestive meal. And that would be pythons. And there are some, seen, some sturgeon species. Hmm. It does seem that they, we've been able to show, not through metabolism, but looking at the blood flow, so cardiac output, the, the amount of blood and the rate that blood's being pumped out of the heart, that, and looking at how much blood goes to the gut that there's, I think this uh, work was done on white sturgeon, that they might have that type of, like, that they're more designed for 
digesting a meal for the maximum metabolic demands than swimming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we better start